After four years as the country's official opposition, thanks to an inspiring campaign by former leader Jack Layton, the NDP set out in the 2015 election race with real hopes of winning for the first time ever. It didn't happen. And now the party is back in third place and polling these days at just 11.7%. As the party's policy convention and leadership review approaches this weekend, let's look at what happened and what's next with Craig Scott, former MP for the riding of Toronto Danforth, Gerald Kaplan, former national director for the NDP, Jennifer Hollett, the party's 2015 candidate in University Rosedale, and Martin Singh, the party's 2015 candidate in Brampton North, and I am happy to welcome you four new Democrats to our table here at TVO. Jerry, to you first, I want to remind everybody that a month before Last October's election, your party was polling at 37 percent, and mm -hmm. things looked amazing. And then on election day, you got less than 20 percent, a tad less than 20 percent. Why do you want to rub this in? I'm not rubbing it in. <laughs> I'm merely leading to the question was, was the 37 percent, in some respects, a false high? Uh, well, we'll never know, will we? Um, and there's no reason to think it was, because it had uh, gone on for a very long time. Uh, Craig may remember the numbers better than I. It seems to me a whole year that we were in first place. Uh, it can't be a fluke every single month. Uh, people repeat their opinion and it's the same all the time. So it wasn't just know what a parked doing. vote? No, I think what you can now say is that it was a soft vote mm -hmm. and that a lot of those people were not committed under, any, under all circumstances to the NDP and maybe didn't even take much to dislodge them. Uh, but I see no reason to think that if the campaign well, here's my bias. If the campaign had been run differently, and if, frankly, uh, Mr. Trudeau hadn't been such an effective campaigner, that it could have been the dream that uh, some of us have spent our entire life waiting for. Jennifer, the party analyzed what happened and concluded as follows. The lack of a strong, simple narrative made it difficult to communicate our platform and positions, and as a result, it became difficult for Canadians to distinguish us from the Liberals. You ran in University of Rosedale, lost by 12,000 votes. Is that how you experienced the campaign? Yes, and I say this as a former TV journalist, someone who has studied and spent my career in communications. We were outchanged by the Liberals in terms of perception. And there was a lot of talk about change, right? We were ready for change. The Liberals were real change. And, and ultimately, this was a change campaign. I think our biggest failure is we wrote a ballot box question that we weren't able to answer. Stop Harper. That was the campaign we ran, and we did that. You ran the, you ran the Stop Harper campaign, yep. but did not benefit from it. Right. And I, and I wish I didn't have to say that. That's not the campaign I was running in University of Rosedale. But those were the signs that we were holding up and putting on top of our signs across the country. And that's where we, we failed as a party. We didn't make the case for the NDP. Hmm. Martin, you lost by more than 15,000 votes, as it turned mm -hmm. out, in Brampton North. Yes. Again, I, I, I'm not trying to rub that in. I'm just trying to put it on it's the all record. good. We're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you experienced the campaign as well? Um, to a certain extent, um, but I, I would say this, that part of it you could say was, you know, we should have had maybe a different message and whatnot, but also too, I think there was a lack of capacity on behalf of a number of the different local campaigns to actually spread the message that we did have. Um, we talk about the things that didn't go so well in the campaign, but one of the things that did go very well is that we had a fantastic crop of candidates. I mean, in all the years that I've been in the party, uh, with no disrespect to those who have run the past, I think at least in Peel Region, we had, you know, skilled, intelligent people, life experience and whatnot, but uh, they just didn't have the financial resources, most of them, unfortunately, in order to be able to get the message across. Craig, you lost, as I, I think they would call it in your party, a real heartbreaker. 1,200 votes, a very close race in Toronto Danforth, Jack Layton's old riding. The report says we lost the game this time, but we didn't lose who we are. Let's explore that. Who are you as a new Democrat now? Well, we're a, a party that um, actually knows that what we were campaigning on was a fantastic offer for Canadians that was uh, unfortunately poorly communicated, both for structural reasons and I think for uh, reasons that have to do with a campaign that wasn't fully operational in the way it should have been. Um, I, I honestly don't think we're a party that doesn't have the foundations uh, of, a, of an ambitious, bold, and indeed transformative message for, for the country already locked into uh, who we are. It's just, this was a campaign where a lot of understandable decisions were made that um, didn't allow Canadians to uh, be enthusiastic about who we are. What um, is that expression, we weren't fully operational? What does that mean? 
Well, I, I think uh, the review panel report that came down, uh, the interim was before and the final came down last week, I think it adequately summarized a bunch of moving parts that were moving on their own. Um, in different places, <laughs> in different, different places. ways. <laughs> uh, and, and fully operational, I also mean that I think uh, strategic decisions uh, were made that somehow or other failed to see that our biggest strength in a leader-centered universe was to be leading with Tom's strengths as opposed to trying to um, package Tom as a prime minister and waiting with a you know subdued, uh, steady hands kind of message after many people had moved over to us precisely because of the fierce principled way in which he had led the opposition on multiple files. And he was, he allowed himself to, I mean, uh, Tom will, will forgive me for saying that, I think he allowed himself to be packaged in ways where the kind of the, the Harper fighter and the principled person to, didn't come together in the campaign. Well, certainly one of the things, Jerry, that surprised people were was the notion that Tom Mulcair was going to be the deficit buster and campaign on a balanced budget when Justin Trudeau was not. How did that happen? Uh, I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, I'm very critical of the campaign, so let me, let, me be, uh, uh, and let, let me be on their side for a moment. They thought they misread, this is building on what Craig said, they misread what it would take to get us elected. <clears throat> They believed, and I think this is largely mythology, that Jack did well because he had softened and watered down the left-wing aspect of the party and moved to the center, which I think was irrelevant to almost everybody who voted for us, in fact, in the 2011 election. It's not why I won. And so their question was, okay, if Jack got us this far, how do we get the next step? Well, the next step is we've got to reassure the bourgeoisie, Bay Street, uh, who knows all the people who never voted for us before, and they didn't vote for us before because we were too radical. So how can we show that we're not really radical, that Tom can be trusted to run the country? And that was by, and that's when they went completely haywire. That's mm -hmm. when they took as, as powerful a symbol of neoconservatism as exists these days, the notion of uh, against deficits and for balanced budgets, and they made that the heart of the substantive part of our campaign. Well, except that sitting beside you is a businessman. And it, running on a balanced budget, I'm guessing, wouldn't have offended your small business sensibilities at all, Martin, would it? Uh, it, it didn't offend me personally. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you that it was, it was generally well received in, in my writing. Um, I can also say, though, that it wasn't communicated as well as it could have been. Um, but I want to jump to Craig's point. Like, let the leader be the leader. And, and that was not done throughout the campaign. And, and that is something that I did hear a lot about. Like, I mean, the number of people coming back and chatting with me about balanced budget, you know, I could say may have been, you know, one in a thousand, really, hmm. frankly, one way or the other. The number of people who came to me after the first debate and said, you know, uh, where's the Tom that we know and love? That was many. You heard that a lot. Absolutely. And I think what's so painful about letting the leader be the leader and letting the candidates be the candidates is we saw this here in Toronto in the provincial race and the mayoral race. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we learning these lessons, right? Let our leaders be who they are, rather than say, don't worry, hmm. yeah, don't be scared. It yeah, was a, it, it it was a campaign of, that was afraid to be bold. Um, and um, some of these decisions were taken uh, quite far in advance, including partly because uh, we had rolled into this first place position unexpectedly early. And um, played I, it safe. Yeah, so I think as played it safe, Gene probably took over, and then what was left behind was uh, the ability to pivot to adapt, even within that strategy. I think it was the wrong strategy to start with, and and I have to say that uh, I take collegial responsibility for being part of of not convincing everybody else that we should be going in a much bolder, stop hi uh, hiding our light under a bushel approach to things. Um, and I do want to emphasize that. I think there's a lot of collective responsibility for what happened, which is um, that uh, even on the balanced budget, let's just put it this way, a balanced budget was never intended to be a central uh, campaign pillar. But we had no campaign pillars, pretty much, in terms of our messaging. And so the way in which it rolled out, the fierceness with which Tom chose to be fierce on that point, somehow elevated in people's imagination to being a pillar. But it wasn't supposed to be like that. It was supposed to be, here's our plan. We plan for a balanced budget. Um, that's a normal way to go about things. This is how we're going to try to do it. 
no big deal if we go under mm -hmm. or over, right? But not every party yeah. can get away with the same thing. That's right. A new Democratic Party, uh, particularly in light of the size of the deficits yeah. that were run by the Ontario NDP mm -hmm. government in the early 1990s, has to be purer than pure. I guess the conventional wisdom was, Jerry, as it relates to deficits. Is that uh, a fair enough statement? Uh, I guess. Uh, one of the big mistakes I, I, I've thought, both in the Ontario campaign uh, that Jen mentions and, and in this campaign, is that this was, done, in both cases, the, move, the harsh move to the to the center, even center right, was done without the party being involved, as far as I understand. This was this was a leadership. Uh, no, but uh, I also think no. the liberals did this to us, right? So in downtown Toronto, we had liberals at the door saying, "Yeah, I used to vote NDP, but they moved to the center, and the liberals are moving to the left." They were saying that, and that was a frame very successful from their war room, used by their activists that the media bought into. Because if you looked at our platforms issue by issue. I stand by and I think we'd agree that we had the progressive platform, but we weren't communicating it. And this is a game of communications, especially in a campaign that was three times the length of a regular federal campaign. Because I think if this was a, a five-week campaign, we might have a Prime Minister Tom Mulcair. But there were I other think, straws in the wind that bothered me right from the very beginning, if I may say so, uh, beginning literally at the first morning uh, when Tom had a press conference and refused to take questions from the media. Uh, who in the world had ever done that? Well, only one person had ever done that. He was the guy we were kicking out. Well, so, even he took five questions. And he took five. So what, what, what was it now that we were trying to communicate, that mm. we were as tough as Harper or something, I never knew that. And the second was only days later when uh, Tom refused to uh, join the women's debate unless the Prime Minister did. Uh, and that I did write about. I was trying to be very loyal and so were the people who attacked the Ontario party. We were trying to be very loyal and not go public in our criticisms. But frankly, if you didn't go public, there was no other way I could find to make contact with the, uh, with the center. Uh, uh, we should have said, of course, Will, if there's a women's debate, we're going to be there. It'd be nice if the others showed up. And if they don't, don't be. There'll be an, an empty uh, seat. I think that decision was part of, again, the overall mindset of um, we have to set uh, Tom up as the, the natural uh, prime minister in waiting. It's going to look like a PM. Therefore, creating this axis of debate where, in mm -hmm. fact, Trudeau is marginalized and you know, poor Elizabeth gets lost in the, in the shuffle at the same time, Elizabeth May. Uh, again, um, wrong decision, hmm. uh, including just for pure politics. You just think about this optically and then you work it through and say, that may be what you want to do. Uh, and maybe you're going to still try to do that at some macro level for other parts of the campaign. But on this decision, it was just, frankly, uh, just a little bit um, ill-advised. Uh, the women he, in the party were furious. Yeah. Well, as a conservative friend said to me, and yes, I have conservative friends, mm -hmm. in the federal campaign, it appeared that Tom was more worried about what people were saying about him and the NDP than what he was saying mm -hmm. about the NDP. It seems still right. Hmm. Let me introduce yeah. a new element here, and that is during the course of all of this, uh, people that uh, I guess we used to call left wing, but we now call progressive in this country, uh, posted something called the Leap Manifesto, calling for a leap into a new future. And let's just play a clip here to find out a little bit more about it, and then we'll come back and chat. Go ahead, Sheldon. I think the Leap Manifesto represents an opportunity to move forward. Um, to a new conception of politics, where you have the environmental crises and the social and economic crises intertwined and responses across a spectrum of issues. Are, are they rooted, are these responses rooted in social democratic values? I think so. Um, and, but they're also revolutionary. You know, we're actually talking about a fundamental change in the values that govern our society. We're talking about a, a, a country that's where the economy is based on caregiving, caring for the planet and each other. I mean, those are pretty big shifts from the consumer capitalism that we live in. For those who don't know, that fellow's name is Avi Lewis. His dad was the leader of the Ontario NDP. His grandfather was the leader of the federal NDP. And more importantly, Jennifer, for your purposes, he's your fellow City TV alumnus. That's right. We both worked at Much Music. <laughs> yes, you did. What do you think about uh, the leap he's suggesting? I think the leap manifesto is juicy and at a time where we need bold ideas within the party. And it's also driven by movements. You can find it online, but at its core, 
it proposes a non-polluting economy. These are the conversations that we should be having. I think there were, uh, was that cautious kind of nervous approach to the Leap Manifesto during the campaign. But right now, uh, those engaged with the Leap Manifesto, the activists, are taking it writing by writing. And I think we're going to have a really healthy and lively conversation around it at convention this week. What's your view on it, Martin? When I, when I read through it, I, I found that, you know, maybe about 50% of what was written already is already things that we've run on. Uh, you know, for example, the, the universal child care plan, you know, is straight out of our, is straight out of our policy book. And so uh, it doesn't shock me that New Democrats are interested in it. Um, some of the other more ambitious ideas around, you know, retraining, you know, oil, oil workers and, and that type of thing, I, I would like to see more details on that before I, you know, put my stamp of approval one way or the other on You're that. You're not embracing it entirely yet. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I embrace a, a bunch of it because it looks like, you know, NDP policy, hmm. you know, and so, and so it doesn't shock me that the folks are, are interested and, in, you know, I would support those, those items, but I guess I support them already. So I'm not so sure what I see different in that respect with, with the Leap Manifesto. Craig, you've signed on to it. You're going to be promoting this at the convention? No, I think there's a bit of an illusion about uh, uh, the Toronto Danforth and Vancouver East, Libby Davies' former writing. Uh, we've embraced it at the level of principle, but we're insisting that a democratic, internal democratic uh, process takes place over the next two years to actually cash out what those principles mean and also to see whether or not there might be some policy implications that uh, that the NDP can't embrace, right? Mm -hmm. There's a few things in there that aren't necessarily as fully thought of as they should be. So, I, yes, I embrace it. Uh, I think just the throw... I'll just give you an example, not a controversial one. Throwing in the example that, by definition, this whole platform means uh, an automatic decrease in military spending. That actually doesn't flow through from the rest of the analysis in the document. Mm -hmm. It could be that we actually turn out to want a beefed-up military that has a completely different orientation that ties into the climate change agenda that has to do with, with fighting uh, both uh, global inequality and climate change. So I think there was just a non sequitur in that part of the document. So we uh, are pushing hard for a combined Toronto Danforth Vancouver East resolution that says embrace the high level principles but let's have a serious internal democratic approach that includes a, uh, something the NDP has not been able to do, a serious uh, online collaborative policy making uh, platform so that in 2018 we come forward with concrete policies that have taken the Leap Manifesto seriously but are our own. They're not somehow dra uh, grabbed from a bunch of drafters outside and plopped into our policy book without further discussion. Are you going to be looking for a commitment at the convention to that? Yeah, absolutely. To that so, two-year process. Yeah, so there's a Toronto Danforth resolution that says that and a Vancouver East resolution that says that with a slightly more uh, more elegance of formulation and we're trying to put the two together. Gotcha. And Jerry? so there are about 15 other writing associations that, however, I call them the holus bolus resolutions. They basically want to take the Leap Manifesto and say, it's so good, we just plop it into our policy book and we have our next election already there. I just think that's wrong. It's disempowering. It actually is not empowering. Um, because you've actually taken an external document and said somehow or other you found some kind of a, 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 a messiah in textual form for the party that needs to work this through on their own. So I'm both a supporter of the, of the, of the Leap Manifesto and a skeptic that it should be brought in holus bolus. Jerry, I'm going to read an excerpt from it, then I want you to comment it uh, if you would. We could live in a country powered entirely by renewable energy, woven together by accessible public transit, in which the jobs and opportunities of this transition are designed to systematically eliminate racial and gender inequality. Caring for one another and caring for the planet could be the economy's fastest growing sectors. Many more people could have higher wage jobs with fewer work hours, leaving us ample time to enjoy our loved ones and flourish in our communities. How's that sound to you? Uh, well, it certainly sounds like a wonderful world that I'd be glad to uh, see, although I fear I'm a little too old for, to, to have that happen. I mean, remember, the source of this is pretty important. That young man, Avi Lewis, on his way back from the hospital uh, when he was born, had his parents sing solidarity forever to him, you know? So uh, he's right in the mainstream. It's bread in the bone um, for him. But I, I want to tell you that I hadn't heard Craig's uh, elaboration until now, and I think it's the most exciting thing I've heard for the party in many, many years. The proposition that the Leap Manifesto, which would seem to me a wonderful blueprint for the world if it happened to be implemented tomorrow, uh, which it, it can't be, um, 
for the party to debate all of that and to come up with the parts that are real and that we could campaign on and those that uh, are politically either unacceptable or unrealistic, mm -hmm. I think would be the best thing that could ever happen to the party. It's an anti-pipeline document. Are you okay with that, Martin? Yeah, well, the thing, the thing is this, is that there, there's not enough detail inside the document on those particular items in order to make a concrete statement one way or the other, and that's part of the difficulty that I have with it. Uh, I, I much appreciate Craig's position and the position of those, you know, with him to say that it's something that we should, you know, bring forth in principle and, and discuss, you know, more over time. And, and I think once we thresh out the details on that, it'll be clear, you know, what's doable, what's not doable, as Jerry said, and also what we can support and what we can't. Given Avi Lewis's background, mm. do you think he is a potential future leader of the federal NDP? Uh, gee, I don't know. He's a filmmaker. Uh, it's a long way from there. To, uh, we're not looking for a, a future leader at the moment, by the way. At the moment, we have a future leader, so I don't know even why it's a question. Well, it's a question because uh, I don't have to tell you how many times over the years I have heard people say, given who his grandfather was, given who his father was, it would make a hell of a lot of sense for him to become a leader of some NDP party somewhere in Canada. Well, as an old friend of the Mishwacha, I can tell you that <laughs> a lot of us have thought for many, many decades that someday a Lewis or Landsberg, and now a Klein, has got to end up as the first uh, socialist prime minister of Canada. Uh, and I have to tell you that uh, I'm still waiting. You're still waiting. Okay. Here are, remember James Laxer? Jimmy Laxer, yes, I remember. I we, thought you might. We've been close friends for decades. Still? Yep. Good. Uh, you may remember back in the day when he led something called the Waffle, Very which was I... expelled from the NDP because it, uh, well, for a yes. whole lot of complicated reasons. I started it and, and helped end it. <laughs> that's right. It's true. Well, <laughs> that's, that's actually it right. right. Uh, here's a couple of things he tweeted recently. He said, Millennials beware. If you are trying to remake the NDP, and you should, most virulent anti-socialists I ever encountered were in the NDP elite. And he says, the second thing, he says, if Feel the Burn, this is a Bernie Sanders reference here, if Feel the Burn had been Canadian and had run for the NDP leadership, party elite would have expelled him and those who agreed with him. It doesn't sound like he's over the fact that he got expelled from the NDP four decades ago. But what do you think he's not, says Craig? What do you think about what he's saying about the leadership of your party right now? Um... I'm, I'm a little taken aback. It seems awfully harsh. Uh, uh, and I guess the answer gets answered at the convention to see how the leadership of the party, whoever it is beside the leader, and I don't know what the new elite is. There's always an elite in a party. If, our, if we have one, I don't know about it. Uh, what they do with the elite manifesto. And if they're prepared to uh, take what seems to me this wonderfully rational position, exciting position that Craig outlines, or whether they uh, come down hard on it, uh, I can see a, uh, a leadership that would be terrified by the Leap Manifesto, that they'd go through it and underline all the parts that the others would use to just clobber the hell out of us. Hmm. Uh, if you were so inclined, you could also look at most of those parts and say, well, they make sense under certain circumstances, but you're obviously not going to rush into it. We are not going to bear keep all our natural resources buried uh, in the immediate future, even if many scientists say that's the right way to go. Jennifer. Pro tip, if you want to reach youth, don't call them millennials, especially on Twitter. Uh, I, I think... When you're Jim's age, it doesn't matter. <laughs> What's <laughs> worth picking up on, though, is the idea of party elite. Uh, who is the party elite? Are we the party elite? Am, am I the party? This is the question and the conversation I have with members. Who is the party? And we have to get to a point where members feel that they are the party. Mm -hmm. And also, if we want to feel the burn in Canada, we need to have the support of youth. And young people came out in huge numbers and voted for Trudeau in the past. It was the NDP. NDP, we are the party of the youth. That's why I picked the NDP, because of Jack Layton. He made the time to connect with youth when I was a much music VJ, right? Those are the spaces we were in, and, and that's what we have to get back to, is actually connecting with youth and that generational change within the party and the party elite. But Craig, if I can infer from these tweets, he seems to be exposing a chasm here between the so-called NDP elites, who I guess made some of the decisions that the people around this table objected to in the last campaign, and the grassroots of the, of the party. Uh, that's a fair observation, isn't no, it? No, I mean, James Laxer does not represent the grassroots of, of, the, of the current party at all. And uh, those, uh, the other thing I object to is that uh, it, it happens everywhere, but the, the idea of appropriating a term and then somehow projecting your own views as the sole uh, embody, embodiment of the values. So 
uh, the idea that, uh, say, the Socialist Caucus in, in the NDP, the, that the folks who adhere to that are somehow the only socialists in the, uh, in the NDP doesn't follow, right? Because they have a Facebook group or call a press right. conference. And, and so, and, and so, I mean, James is, I mean, I don't have, I have no uh, interactions with James uh, at all, but, I mean, he's every right to be an external critic in that way and to go back to what his experience, he thought his experience was 40 years ago. Uh, and let's just put it this way. It'd be illogical to think that a party that was elected with something like 70 new MPs in 2011 uh, had to go to a new leader after the uh, earlier leader passed away and had to pull everything together in three years. It'd be illogical to think that a degree of discipline and indeed top-down control did not take place as part of getting ready. Uh, and so to that extent, uh, yeah, there's something that is in tension with a true, uh, a party that takes seriously more social knowledge and grassroots uh, involvement I honestly think that we do have to move in a direction that is different from how we have gone in the last three years. And that's not a blame thing. It's a descriptive thing. Okay. Let's yeah. see if this is part of the road ahead. Uh, Martin, I'll get you to comment on this. This is a posting on Facebook from a guy named Thomas Galazut, who says, in my opinion, we have a choice between three visions. The vision articul articulated by the Leap Manifesto, a return to socialist values, staying on course with the plan articulated under Jack Layton and finalized under Tom Mulcair. Are those, in your view, the right options for consideration? No, I, I think that's far too limiting. I mean, uh, uh, you know, among others, uh, I've, I've been very fortunate to attend convention, you know, since I think it was held in Winnipeg in 2001, been every single one, and, and I'm continuously pleased and also surprised uh, at, you know, the dynamic atmosphere that happens there and the ideas that come forward from the membership. I, I, have, I have full faith that, you know, the party will find its way. You know, we simply have to make sure that the structure exists there, that the grassroots are able to, you know, speak their speak their mind and, and have those people in the staffing the positions, whether it be Ottawa or Queen's Park or wherever it may be, to be able to take that and then formulate the policy on which we can run on an election campaign. You say you have no doubt the party will find its way, mm -hmm. but I think for a, a great number of Canadians, part of that way has been stolen by the guy who won the election. And they wonder, what's left for you? What problem exists in Canada today for which the NDP is the solution? Uh, interesting that you would even suggest that Canada has, you know, become the utopia and that there's not challenges that we face. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that obviously the guy who's now Prime Minister ate a lot of your lunch in the last election. I don't think that's that controversial to say. Yeah, I, I would, well, there's, there's, two, there's two points on that. One, I, I think that we're in massive agreement that things could have been done differently in the last mm -hmm. campaign. Um, uh, in addition to that, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, what the current government will, will do uh, with respect to some of their promises, uh, either to keep them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and parts of that are coming out right now. I know that, for example, young people in this great country are, are, are challenged in terms of being able to find appropriate work. I can remember promises made in the campaign by the current government um, that that was going to be addressed and absolutely nothing was done about it or any dollars put towards it in the most recent uh, budget. And, and so it's, it's not, you know, how shall I put it, it's, it's not as though there aren't things for us to work on. There, there are many. And in fact, I think that you'll see this not just through the Leap Manifesto, but by, through many other resolutions that come forward at convention. Jerry, what do we still need the NDP for? Um, well, uh, I'd be a damn fool if I didn't pretend that the Liberal government is doing very, very well. Uh, and for most Canadians, is in the process of implementing its policies. But uh, increasingly, uh, Pundits and columnists are pointing out all the places where they're not doing that. All the promises that are being ignored, all the promises that are only being half introduced. Uh, so I don't think there's any doubt that, um, and I hope I don't mean this partisanly, it's just how tough it is to govern this country, that a lot of what the Liberals are doing is going to stop being embraced quite as wholeheartedly as now. Uh, that obviously uh, opens something for us, um, and I never doubt the capacity of NDP opposition MPs to function well. We have forever. That, uh, for years, even when we weren't the official opposition, we happily called ourselves, and people didn't mind us calling ourselves the real opposition. Mm -hmm. So that, that will come, and that will be revivifying. Uh, but besides that, I go back to holus bolus. I have become suddenly, in the course of this one program, a great fan <laughs> of, uh, uh, of uh, Craig's, uh, Craig's strategy. Uh, look, the word socialist 
is not in itself an end of anything. Socialism means something. It means social justice. It means egalitarianism. And that's what the Leap Manifesto is, without ever using that word. Uh, so I, I reject this kind of proposition. As for the Socialist Caucus, I, the, the, the so-called Socialist Left Caucus, I have more influence with the Pope than they have in the NDP. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you that. True words have not been spoken. I think the Pope's a social mm -hmm. democrat. If we can put that on, a, on the table. OK, yeah. can I use some of this language here? Okay. Okay, the word socialism has come up. Apparently, Bernie Sanders has found millions of socialists in the United States, so it's not the dirty word of, I guess it once was. He also said yeah. that his sympathies are with the NDP. Has he said yeah, that? Yeah, he has said that, are. yeah. Do you prefer the word socialism, or do you prefer the word intersectionality, which is getting a lot of play these days? Hmm, that's interesting. So as a feminist... And maybe you should tell us yes, what, what you understand mean, intersectionality sure, to mean. Like, as, as a feminist, intersectionality means that when we are talking about gender, we are connecting it to race that we are connecting it to, to other issues, to, to class, to uh, LGBTQ issues. And we're seeing this right now with movements, making sure that we are connecting the fight for decent work uh, to the climate change movement, to We Believe Survivors, to uh, Black Lives Matter, right? That's, that's intersectionality. Uh, but I, I think we actually do have to make the case for social democracy. And the question you ask is the question, is the question we failed to answer during the campaign and the question we have to ask ourselves at the convention in Edmonton, which is, why NDP? What's the difference between you and the liberals and the conservatives? And my answer to that is that you are better off, I am better off when your neighbor is better off, moving away from the me to the we, right? That's what it's about. It's about investing in communities, not what are you going to do for me, but what are you going to do for my family and neighborhood and community? That's what this comes back to. And that's what $15 minimum wage is about. That's what universal childcare is about. That's what national pharmacare, making sure that young people can afford to work and live in downtown Toronto. That's what it's about. But the Liberals have embraced and stolen much of that agenda. Well, I, I, I wish we were talking I mean, we'll about see. universal child care or $15 minimum wage. Uh, Andrea Horvath just came out with a commitment to that. It, it wasn't Kathleen Wynne. Uh, pharmacare, these very issues. So they're very good on the sound bites. We're not. We have to get better at that. But ultimately, if they are not the change they claim to be, young people know that, they live that, and that's our opportunity. Craig, what do we need the NDP for? Uh, to be firm uh, advocates of the kind of values that uh, uh, Jen has outlined and uh, to somehow or other get people to understand that double-voiced politics coming from a centrist party is, is not ultimately going to break a lot of the structures that need to be broken for true social justice and for fighting against climate change. Um, ultimately, it still has to be an inspiring party but I actually believe that that uh, comes from a combination of integrity, trust, and drawing, truly drawing on social knowledge, uh, on the experience and the expertise of everyday uh, Canadians, uh, however they've come to their knowledge. Uh, the Liberals are fantastic at brokering elite knowledge. Uh, in fact, that was evident in this campaign. And they're also good at a rhetorical uh, overlay in getting better under this new prime minister who you know who has certain values that can't be gainsaid that they're real about connection but he's using it in a very plebiscitarian way he's trying to create this kind of direct populist link between him and the canadian population using a lot of rhetorical uh, means to do so uh, we have to be real about how we connect to canadians i have 30 seconds left long enough to ask the three of you the three who uh, ran in the last election who are going to edmonton how you intend to vote on the issue of Tom Mulcair's leadership. Martin? I'll be supporting Tom. Jennifer? For me, it's a secret ballot, and I actually think the questions are deeper than leadership. Craig? Uh, what I'll say is uh, I do not like to see um, uh, collective responsibility reduced to individual responsibility, and I don't like to see a, an NDP tradition of uh, our leaders moving on on their own broken. That sounds like you're voting against a review. Uh, I've said what I've said. You've said what you've said. And said it well. Thanks, everybody, for participating in our discussion here on TVO tonight. Craig Scott, Jennifer Hollett, and Gerald Kaplan and Martin Singh on the other side of the table. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.